In this video, I'm going to talk about the photoelectric effect, part of the IB syllabus. Please read through the success criteria I plan to cover in this video. So first of all, this is a pretty important experiment. This is the one that Einstein got his Nobel Prize for. It wasn't relativity. It wasn't that E equals MC squared thing. The diagram I've got here comes from the FET simulation, and you can see I've got the URL there that you can go check this out for yourself. Let's just go through what's actually happening in this experiment. Okay, so first of all, I've got light here, and it's landing on this surface. Now, this surface is going to be a metal, because what happens when light lands on the surface of a metal is it actually gives off electrons, and we're going to call those photoelectrons because it's caused by the light. Now, you can see right here, this is in a vacuum chamber. Why? Well, the molecules of air would run into these electrons and disturb its path moving through. So we're going to do it in a vacuum. Okay, now what happens is when I shine the light on here, the light gives the electrons enough energy that they actually leave because they have some kinetic energy. And since they have kinetic energy, they can move across to this side. And what's going to happen? I'm going to actually see some current flows through my circuit. Without the photoelectric effect, there'd be no reason for electrons to go from one side to the other. This would be like a break in the circuit, and it would be more like a capacitor. So, what did he do with this light, and why was it so important? Well, first of all, you can see here that he must have tried it with light of very different wavelengths. And he was able to change the intensity of the light. Now, here's where some really cool things happened. He found, when he saw light on this, that he didn't always get a current coming across. It actually depended on the frequency or the wavelength of the light about whether or not electrons can move from one side to the other. He also then put the battery backwards, so he made this side here negative. So in other words, yes, electrons could still go from left to right because they have some kinetic energy. It's like you can walk backwards on one of those um, moving sidewalks, right? But if it was going faster and faster, eventually you're not going to be able to do it. Same thing here. So they increased and in, increased how negative it was until no more current would travel. And we call that the cutoff voltage, or sometimes some places will call it the retarding potential because it stops it. it. The electric potential energy will stop it. And so then they could figure out how much energy these electrons, how much kinetic energy these electrons really had. So he thought, well, what if I change the intensity? And back to those frequencies or wavelengths that could not allow electrons to flow through, we had no current, it didn't matter at all how much intensity he had, they still wouldn't move from the left to the right side. In fact, the intensity, if there were electrons and already a current, the intensity gave them a greater current, but still couldn't work for those other frequencies. So you can see here I've got some data. Now a lot of places will show it in very different ways, but what I have here on the um, y-axis is the actual current that I'm measuring, and here is that potential I was talking about. Hmm, look, yellow right down here had a stopping potential about here. Since it's stopping potentials around here, that told us that with the yellow light, the electrons given off had less kinetic energy than, say, with the violet. Yellow, then green, then blue. Hey, take a look at this violet. Here's a low intensity light, and here's a high intensity light. They're both violet. They have the same cutoff potential, which means changing the intensity didn't actually give the electrons more kinetic energy. It actually changed the current that was given off. You can see here that on the y-axis that my high intensity had a much higher current than the lower intensity. So remember, current is related to the number of electrons.
So high intensity must have allowed more electrons to be released, but not ones with more kinetic energy. That seems to be tied to the frequency or the wavelength. Now when I take all those frequencies and I plot them for the yellow color, the green, the blue, the purple, and I plot them versus the kinetic energy that we saw for given to them from the potential energy. Let me just pause for a moment and show you how we can get the kinetic energy of the electrons. Let's say we gave them 75 volts. Because they're electrons, that means each electron actually had 75 electron volts of energy. Remember, electron volts is energy value. And now if I want to turn that into joules, I'm just going to take my 75 and multiply it by the charge of a electron. And that will give me 1.2 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. Okay, and that's the value I've got graphed on my uh, y-axis. Right now it looks like 0, 0, 0, and that's only because this number is so small I didn't actually expand um, what my numbers were written on or how many uh, decimal places it would write. So let's see some of the important parts of this graph. So first of all, right here, my x-axis, that is what we call the threshold frequency. It's going to be the minimum frequency needed in order to have electrons emitted from the surface of our metal. So that's that x-intercept. But over here, if you look, we also have a y-intercept. Now, if you think about it, we already know that our y-intercept is it has the units of joules. So what do you think that might imply? So it's actually going to be the amount of energy the electron needs to leave the metal. Now this is the surface of the metal. We're not talking about ones deep down or close to the atom. And it's another reason why we've got metals is because remember they have the sea of electrons around our positive nuclei. So I need to give at least this much energy for an electron to be able to leave our metal. And what this data is showing us is it's linked to this idea of a frequency. Now here's the big deal. The amount of energy coming from the light is actually related to the frequency. Now back when we did waves, we would have been talking about how the intensity is related to the amplitude, but now comes Einstein and he's like, but, 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 for waves, for light, it's going to be different. Light is related to frequency. And this is starting the idea that light can be both a wave and a particle. It can be a wave because of all the things we did with interference, and obviously it has a frequency, but now it's actually showing that it can also be a particle. When we had this, he said that for every one photon, that's a particle of light, that hits an electron, it will give it energy. The amount of energy here we talk about is called the work function. If the photon has sufficient amount of energy for the work function, then the electron can be released. Any energy it has more than that will give the electron some kinetic energy. Okay, so let's talk about some of the findings we had from the photoelectric effect. First of all, we found that increasing the intensity did not increase the kinetic energy given to electrons. But we do know that increased the number of electrons released because we had a greater photocurrent. What this tells us is it's not like a normal wave, because with a normal wave, the intensity is proportional to A squared, the amplitude squared. We also found there was a threshold frequency and if we were less than that, it didn't matter what the intensity was, we would have no photoelectrons emitted. This also adds the idea that light is related to its frequency. Now, it's also leaning towards the fact that light isn't just a wave. Because if it was a wave, then I should be able to just wait longer and longer, and as the traveling wave continues to hit the electron, it should be able to build up energy, and that's not what we have. 
So what did Einstein tell us then? Well, light must also have a particle nature, which he called a photon. He said that the energy is related to its frequency, and we can use the equation E equals HF. H is Planck's constant, and if we think about the graph that we just had, it's actually the gradient of that graph. And finally, we have that one photon will emit one electron if it has more than the work function. Okay, so before we go into doing this example, I just want to go through one of the equations we have in our data booklet. First of all, if we think about this, we have the amount of energy that is in our photon. And that's going to go to the kinetic energy of the electron and to the work function. I have a W here, but our data booklet doesn't use a W, it uses a phi. Now in terms of the energy of the photon, we just said that that is Planck's constant times its frequency. And in our data booklet, we have EK max. Now that's important because this is if all of the energy of the photon went directly to kinetic energy of the electrons. It could be that some went into heat or something else, which is why we say max plus our work function. But our data booklet has this rearranged. So they have E max, so that's the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, will equal HF, the energy associated with the photons, minus the work function. So our question here says, which of the following is a correct statement associated with the photoelectric effect? Let's look at D first. The energy of the emitted electrons does not depend on the frequency of the incident light. Absolutely not. That's incorrect. That's what we just used, the conservation of energy, to show where our first equation came from. The energy of the emitted light depends on the intensity. No, that was one of the findings of our uh, photoelectric effect. The energy depends on its frequency. B. The electrons are only emitted if the incident is above a certain minimum wavelength. Well, if you remember, it wasn't wavelength we talked about, it was frequency. And because we have this equation, I said I needed to have a minimum frequency. That would correspond to a maximum wavelength. So let's go look at A. The emission is instantaneous, and that is correct. And that was one of the reasons why we said light has a particle nature, because if it was only a wave nature, I should be able to wait longer and longer and be able to get one eventually. But with the photoelectric effect, I either have one photon creating one photoelectron, or I don't have anything at all. Okay, so let's go through another example. When monochromatic light, i.e. light of only one wavelength or one frequency, is shone on a clean metal surface, electrons are emitted from the surface due to the photoelectric effect. State and explain. So tell me the effect and don't forget to tell me why. The effect on the emitted electrons. So increasing the frequency of the light. Well, if I increase the frequency, I will increase the energy of the photons. That means there'll be more energy to be given to the electrons and that's what we're supposed to be talking about, not just photons. That means the energy maximum of the kinetic energy of the electrons is going to increase as well. Second part, increasing the intensity of the light. Well, if I increase the intensity, I increase the number of photons. What is that going to do? That's going to increase the number of electrons, but not their kinetic energy photo current will increase. Okay, they give us a threshold frequency of lithium, and we need to calculate the work function. Now, if you remember the definition of threshold frequency, that was the minimum frequency of light needed in order to release a photoelectron. That would be the minimum amount of energy needed to release the photoelectron. That is the work function. So, I'm going to put it into my equation. Energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. And I get 3.65 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So one more thing. Remember, when it says stating an appropriate unit, when it has three marks like that, one of which is just for writing down joules. So if you remember that the work function was to be measured in joules, you got yourself a mark. 
And now we need to find out how much energy those electrons are going to get. Now we can use our equation for the data booklet. And in this case, we're going to use Planck's constant again, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, times the incident light that we have, 6.2 times 10 to the 14, and minus the work function we just calculated above. And we're going to get our answer of 4.6 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. So take another moment and read the success criteria. I hope what this video has helped you be able to say yes I can to all those statements.